took intense notes of just what Brian was saying. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to set the record straight. One shared consciousness is how Brian thinks about building his business, building his team. That is not founder's mode as we've been hearing it. What's not being talked about is teams win and the Elon Musks and Steve Jobs are the outliers. Let's not encourage all of our founders to have a 10% chance of success. Welcome to Turpentine Finance, a podcast where we talk with top founders and finance leaders about what it takes to architect success. Our guests speak candidly about big business inflections, market curveballs, and how they approach decision making so that you have the tactics and mental models for when the pressure is on. I'm your host, Sasha Orlov, founder, CEO, and self professed finance nerd. You ready? Let's dive in. All right. All right. This is quite exciting. So we're doing a rushed version today because for those of you living under a rock, forget it. Everybody's seen it. Let's just talk about this founder mode essay. And Jim wrote this response and we are here to talk about it. So uh, Jim, hi, welcome to the show. Hey, Sash. Thanks. Thanks for kicking this off. I love it. Yeah. All right. So the past week, Paul Graham, who's the founder of the startup accelerator Y Combinator, wrote this essay called Founder Mode. And it went absolutely viral. So 20 million views, thousands of reposts. So uh, for, for those that didn't read all the fine print, so it was, it was come from a private talk with Brian Chesky, the founder and CEO of Airbnb. And it was edited by some fairly prominent people as well. Patrick Collison, Ron Conway, Jessica Livingston, Elon Musk, Ryan Peterson, Harsh Tagger, Gary Tan. And to be just fully transparent, founder in YC. And these private talks were magical and insightful. And they're usually kept private. But this one went somewhat viral. The problem is it causes a lot of interest, but it's also quite vague in what this actually means and can be interpreted in a lot of ways in which Jim wrote a post about it. So let me just, for those that didn't read it or or it's not part of top of memory, I'm going to just go through two quotes and then we'll start kicking off the conversation. All right, one quote, the conventional wisdom about how to run larger companies is mistaken. As Airbnb grew, well-meaning people advised him, Brian, that to run the company in a certain that you had to run the company in a certain way for scale. And their advice could optimistically summarized as hire good people and give them room to do their jobs. So he followed the advice and the results were disastrous. So he had to figure out a better way on his own. So after talking I'm inserting with a lot of people and and researching it, end quote. Mulling it over for quite a bit, I figured out what the answer was. What we were told was how to run a company that you hadn't found. So how to run a company if you're just merely a professional manager. And this MO is so much less effective that to founders, it feels problematic. There are things the founders can do that managers can't. And not doing them feels wrong to founders because it is. There are two ways to run a company, founder mode and manager mode. And then PG added a little bit later down the essay, hire good people and give them the room to do their jobs. Sounds great when described that way, doesn't it? Except in practice, judging from report of founder after founder, what this often turns out to mean is hire professional fakers and let them drive your company to the ground. Now, there is all sorts of Twitter reactions and some fun quotes, which we can talk about later. But I think one of the challenges was, I think as PG rightfully acknowledges, is that founder mode is quite vague. But it went so viral, it opened up to what founder mode actually means to Twitter's interpretation, which, as all of us know, can go all over the place. Um, So when I read what you wrote with founders mode, setting the record straight, I immediately was like, yes, all right, let's chat about this. And for those of you who are still living under a rock, Jim has 30 years of experience scaling top Silicon Valley success stories from Series A to IPO from companies like Intuit and Netflix and Mozilla Firefox and many more. So, all right, Jim, let's get into it. You ready? I'm ready. All right. So what prompted you to put pen to paper or fingers to keyboards? So whenever I see something go viral like this, um, I think you and I uh, uh, have been around enough to say, okay, there's something happening here. As I was reading this, you know, we are both at the, what I'm going to say, the age and the stage of seeing many cycles and seeing many bad behaviors through Silicon Valley. And I guess I have learned over time to be a critical thinker of anything I read, not just take it at face value. And I think what hit me right away was just how polarizing these arguments were by Paul's essay. I respect Paul. I respect the founders that weighed in. But the combination of this polarization, as you were reading those quotes, it just was hitting me again. It's like, it's this or it's that. 
it's 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 digital it's one or it's zero it's it's founder or it's professional faker manager it's professional like and whenever i hear arguments like that it sets of course it sets up to go viral what's worse is what what's worse in this case was that this was a private panel talk exclusive invite only nobody recorded it paul graham said nobody recorded it and therefore he had to transcribe what he heard and others in the audience had to transcribe what they heard and that number two red flag for me number three I'm a huge fan of Brian Chesky. I follow Brian Chesky. I think his his values are spot on. And it immediately dawned on me because I'm a research guy at heart and, and I, I just write all sorts of best ofs that this is not how Brian thinks. Um, so I'm thinking, okay, I just have this curation brain. I know I've heard this before. And so I went to the internet and did the work. And sure enough, I found a video where he talks about this exact founders mode. In fact, he named it founders mode in, in a famous podcast, Lenny Richisky, um, who's 500,000 followers only nine months ago. And what did I do on Saturday? A few days ago, I, I, I listened for two hours intently. I took intense notes of just what Brian was saying. And then I'm like, Oh my gosh, I got to set the record straight. So all my intent of this post was simply to, yeah, have a bit of a direct take on what I was hearing and and really oppose what I call polarization arguments. These other people call them straw man fallacies, right? This this set set, you know, founders are great, traditional managers on the other end of the scale are bad. And so therefore, anything in between in a straw man fallacy argument has got to be good because if I set the bad as really, really bad, the problem is nobody hires traditional managers in Silicon Valley. Not that I know of, right? Traditional managers are IBM Dilbert types with the tie, right? And and for him to, it, look, you know, I'm going to take Paul down a little bit when he called them professional fakers. That's just, come on, right? You're going to disparage anyone who's not a founder. Anyone who's not a founder, you're going to call a professional faker. And if you read it, it's like you did. But here's the problem because, you know, you can write a post like that. When I started seeing all the Twitter sphere, a lot of founders saying, I've been waiting for this opportunity. I've been waiting. I've, I've been wanting to take back. Um, we have a lot to talk about in why I wrote this post, but that's why I wrote it. And let's, I, we can get into a lot of this, but let's definitely get into it. All right. All right. So uh, I, I'm a founder. Um, I, I, I do have to admit that um, in scaling a couple companies, uh, I've seen felt a little out of place. Um, and part of that, I think there are a lot of founders out there who are first time founders and they're growing their companies. Their companies happen to scale. They hit product market fit. They hit massive velocity and they don't know what they're doing. They haven't been inside of a big company. They've never been a professional manager before. And they're being told and you hire because somebody was on this resume or the board tells you to, and it can feel uncomfortable. Um, you sort of put a little bit into, I think, a framework which which resonated, which is founder mode plus scaling mode equals leadership mode. Can you talk a little bit about what that means? Again, I, 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 I whenever I see polarized arguments, you know, the answer is always in the middle. So I thought to myself, founders mode is only one mode of working, and founders mode is the mode when you first start a company that is actually an accurate way of working. It's not wrong, but there's also a mode called scaling mode in which there comes a point when you have over, I would say 50 people in a company, some may argue a hundred, where you have to hire others to do specialized jobs that you don't know how to do because by definition, there is no human being on the planet that knows how to do every job, right? And what was happening in the Twitter sphere is I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna institute founders mode and I'm gonna go back and you've now given me the power to be less disenfranchised and tell all these managers that I've VPs that I've hired how to do their jobs. It's like, okay, there's that polarized thinking again. So you need scaling mode. You need you need to bring in experts who have a founder's philosophy. So here's where the middle comes, right? Hire leaders who have a founder's mentality, but it, it's not required to be a founder. Working as a founder should not be exclusive to a founder. The behaviors of a, you can find that. But if you want to label them professional managers, then don't hire those professional managers. My issue is, right? My issue is leadership mode. 
these founders who are saying they're disenfranchised, that they trusted all these advisors and they took their hands off the wheel and now they get to take it back, really should be looking in the mirror and asking and, and really holding themselves accountable for taking their hands off the wheel. My point was in my post, you should never take your hands off the wheel as a founder. You should let it go. You should delegate some things. But the fact that they took it completely off and now they're complaining about being disenfranchised and now they're going to go full black in like a running bull and tell everybody how to do everything again, both are wrong, right? Lead as a founder, lead with your specialized operators as a scaler. And that's what I call leadership mode. It's just different forms of leadership. But, you know, look, look in the mirror and, and realize that learn how to lead a team and you will be a successful founder. If you think you can lead the whole company as a founder, I, this I wrote in my post, you will fail. Hard stop. So there's, there is this like some lore that we, we see in Twitter and on TechCrunch or whatever the sort of things are about this like type of leader that you're supposed to be. And I think the, the most extreme version of that is Elon Musk, right? He's running multiple huge companies. He seems to be deep in the weeds and details of everything. Um, and so I'm trying to sort of reconcile. It's hard to argue with success, but obviously that's not the only type of leadership and success. There's plenty of other um, successful companies that run. And, and obviously I think it would be hard to be in the weeds of so many companies, every single detail. How, well, what do we pick and choose as founders? What should we be into the weeds and details of? And what are the things where we probably should, should let go of? I, because I think PG's, SA just has such hyperbolic language, um, merely a professional manager, founder after founder, professional fakers. Like it is, it is a, a Twitter primed essay if there ever was one before. And, and, and it took headlines and, and it was polarizing, but, but it's not helpful because we've seen these, we've seen these memes come back before and people just follow them um, to their detriment. Founders follow them, like get big fast. Um, or back in the old days, it was, it's, you know, it's just, it's just eyeballs are the only thing that matters. Revenue doesn't matter. You don't even need revenue in 1999. You just need to go public or, or you just need a SPAC and that's all you need, right? This polarization of thinking actually is a virus to even some of the smartest people. And I just like to point out the antibody is, is not, is, is to, to counteract the virus, but to, you know, it's okay to be in the details. Let's, let's answer the question. I think founders should be in the details. How they're in the details is what matters. The polarization of the words, I get to micromanage everybody again, you've given me permission. That's the wrong way of being in the details. Being in the details, and Brian Chesky says it himself, and this is why I wrote it, because I went to that two hour video and I wrote down exactly what he said. And he said things like, create transparent feedback loops. Oh, so it's a fascinating interview because I, I think Brian is spot on. He said, it actually saves me time because I've created transparent feedback loops where I don't have to be in the meeting, but our workflow is that every meeting is documented, the assumptions are written down, and I can weigh in asynchronously, and it just saves me time. And then I, he referred to Ben Horowitz's post that he read 10 years ago. So I went and did the research, and he didn't name what the post was, but I remember that I had saved it in my files, and I found it. It was from 2013, and I linked it. And Ben says the same thing. Buried in Ben's great post is he had three points. Write it down. So this is how you're in the details. You write it down. You don't have to be in the room to make the decision, but you have to understand the assumptions. So really, it's about structuring your company for leadership. It's not in this prescriptive, you know, Elon does it this way. Mark Zuckerberg does it that way. Steve Jobs. These are all straw men for the only way to be successful is to be like Elon or Steve. There are many ways to be successful, but I have a very strong view. And for every one Steve Jobs or one Elon Musk, there are nine other successful founders and companies, CEOs, who operate like a true team. And this is what's not being talked about. What's not being talked about is teams win and the Elon Musks and Steve Jobs are the outliers. Let's not encourage all of our founders to have a 10% chance of success. Let's encourage all of our founders to have a 90% chance of success. And I think the evidence and the science is extremely clear that the 90% chance of success is by hiring a good team around you to operate as a team, 
to delegate properly, but to stay in the details. Hey, we'll get back to the conversation in a moment after a word from our sponsors. The less your business spends, the more margin you keep. But today, everything costs more. So smart businesses are graduating to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, bringing accounting, financial management, inventory, HR into one proven platform, helping you reduce IT costs, maintenance costs, and manual errors. Over 37,000 companies have already made the move to NetSuite. Backed by popular demand, NetSuite has extended its one-of-a-kind flexible financing program for a few more weeks. Head to netsuite.com slash 102. That's netsuite.com slash 102. Real Talk. Most talent leaders haven't yet cracked how to leverage AI for meaningful impact on their hiring processes and business goals. But the leaders who are effectively using AI to transform their recruiting team's efficiency and quality use MetaView. MetaView is the AI assistant for the interview process. Their AI records and transcribes hiring conversations, like intakes, interviews, and debriefs, then provides perfectly summarized notes of everything that was discussed. That means your people can focus on creating a human connection with candidates during calls and save time on the busy work of cleaning up notes after every interview. But it's so much more than just a time saver, because perfect notes means perfect data. For every candidate and every pipeline, hiring teams can make confident, informed decisions, and talent leaders can finally take control of the interview process. Join forward-thinking talent leaders at high-performing organizations like Brex, HelloFresh, and Quora, and check out MetaView. Head over to metaview.ai slash heretics to talk to one of MetaView's product experts or get started for free. You'll be up, running, and AI-enabled in minutes. So one of the one of your quotes, uh, uh, which... Uh, or in, in essay was sort of, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go further, go, go together. Um, how do you reconcile that, which I believe with the amount of attention that this essay got? Well, I think the essay was trying to say, it's okay to go alone. It's okay. It's okay to step back in and tell all these specialized operators. They don't know what the hell they're doing. They're, they're professional fakers. I saw a lot of this. You saw a lot of this, you know, my network was, complaining about this in my various networks that I'm in. And I thought to, and, and what they were saying, and Sasha, you're in some of these networks. And I think you saw the same vibe is 90% of the people were saying, someone needs to say something. Someone needs to counteract this. Somebody needs to say something. And I thought to myself, I'm going to be that person to say something because I'm of the age and the stage that I have a very strong opinion on this too. And I have nothing to lose except for making founders and entrepreneurs better and there is a better way, and I'm going to offer a better way, because if we tell all of our founders that they have a 10% chance of winning by going alone versus hiring a team and going together, that's really bad for the ecosystem, especially from extremely credible people like Paul Graham and, and the others that you mentioned. They're credible, and so they're listened to, but there needs to be a counterbalance voice, and I hope to be it. Uh, all right, so I'm going to ask a bit of a snarky question, because let's have some fun a little bit. Uh, so... If we think about sort of the, the land of, of executives and operators and the, the non-founder people that I want to caveat, like I, are required to build a company, no successful company is like a one person sort of delegation machine. Um, one, of the, one of the tweets was uh, sort of alluded to, uh, well, everybody else just is jealous that they're not a founder. Right. It's like the founder gets special privileges and the operators around them just need to like deal with it and get on with the, the show. How much of this is like, how, how do you like, how do you counteract that? That seemed to like continue to be a bit of a theme of just like, you don't get it. You're not a founder. Just deal with it. That's what I call bad behavior of that. That's the bad behavior of founders that wins in the short term, but does not win in the long term. At most successful founders that I follow, I've been fortunate to be involved with a company that's still around into it when it was a hundred people. I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be around of a company that's still around Netflix 27 years ago that we started when we were six people. I'm fortunate enough to be around, you know, things like Mozilla, Fire. like there's more, way more long-term winners than short-term winners. Right. Um, and again, what you're describing is just the polarization effect of, I have permission to have bad behavior. I get to tell everyone just deal with my narcissism right? With like, just deal with it. I'm a founder. So I get that. Like, that's not the way to run a successful team. In fact, a way to run a successful team is to eventually, and you talk to any of these founders, 
Scott Cook eventually turned it over to Bill Campbell and others. Jeff Bezos eventually turned it over to Andy Jassy and others. Bill Gates eventually turned it over to Balmer and eventually to Satya and others. You know, you got Sundar, who's not original CEO. Why, why are those companies, you know, got Tim Cook versus Steve Jobs? Every one of them has taken what that's been created and made it even better. They weren't founders, but they had the founder mentality. So it's not this or that. It's not, I get to behave this way. It's a, there is a better way of winning as a team. And I just, I think the odds of winning as a, I'm a founder, just listen to me. That'll work short term. And Silicon Valley is littered with companies that have been successful for about 10 years and are no longer around. So you have had the pleasure to work alongside some of the greatest founders of all time and some of the greatest leaders of all time. What are some of the lessons of the the things that uh, work really well, where founders can work really well without the vagaries of founder mode, meaning like I tell you what to do and you do it, no questions asked? It's what I write about a lot. It's, it's what I learned from Bill Campbell and others. And so many people talk about it. Just set up a culture where best ideas win. Set up a culture of challenging the assumptions, not challenging the people. Setting up a culture of diverse ideas, right? I, what's interesting is I thought we had finally learned all these lessons. <laughs> and then, a, then, then a, uh, an essay like this comes along and it, it pushes us back about five or six years in some of these really hard lessons that we have learned on how not to behave in leadership. And so when that happens, it's like, okay, sorry, I've got to weigh in here and set the record straight because we've learned these lessons and most times these ways of behaving of leadership fail. Um, and so when Reed Hoffman says, and Brian Chesky says, and, and, and Ben Horowitz says, right? And they don't say it the way Paul said it. Paul was filling in the blanks because there was no video transcript. The Twitter sphere was filling in the blanks because there wasn't a recording. I went to the recording. I said, this is not what he said. So uh, hard to argue. This is what they said. But when Reed Hoffman says, hire people with a founder's mentality, he's spot on. You don't need to hire a founder. In fact, I think he said just recently that he was talking about either Sacha or I can't remember who he was talking about, but he said, um, I consider that person uh, a co-founder, even though they were, the, they were the CEO 20 years into the company. I've got to go pull up that quote. Maybe we will. Maybe we'll go find it. But it's just so telling that it's the way you behave as both a founder and a leader that determines your success, not your title. Do you think, so in, in your formula, you talked about sort of founder mode versus scaling mode gets to leadership mode. Do, do you think that there is a balanced approach? Do you think that there just can be founder mode? It's different between, say, wartime or peacetime. So we take back to uh, uh, Ben Horowitz from, from Andreessen Horowitz's quote that you uh, sort of were, were referencing before. Be aware that management books tend to be written by management consultants who study successful company during times of peace. Um, not uh, remember what the last part was, but so there's something about there's a wartime CEO and there's a, uh, a peacetime CEO. Is this hinting at that or do you think this is something else? I guess, I guess I'm taking a very strong position. This is something else. And there, there is an 80 or 90 percent more probabilistic way of leading with teams. So when you go to Ben's quote, like these things can be taken out of context, right? You're reading from the book, the hard things, you know, hard things first or uh, hard thing about hard things, the hard thing about hard things. I've read it a long time ago. It's great. But Ben also goes on to say in the product CEO paradox that I linked to one, be the integrator as the founder. Think about what I'm, I'm going to say these words slowly, right? Be the integrator. Huh, that doesn't sound like founder's mode. Founder's mode says I get I get to be the czar that pounds my fist on the table. But Ben's saying be the integrator? Okay, so that means I have to actually compile and influence and lead. He says, write it down, don't just say it. Founders are like, just listen to me, don't uh, don't challenge me. I, you know, do what I say. Don't, I'm not gonna write it down. So write it down. And then he goes on to say, number three, don't communicate. I'm reading this now in my blog post. Don't communicate direction outside of your formal mechanisms. He says, quote, this is Ben, ad hoc communication to individual engineers and product managers is fine, but resist the attempt to jump in and give direction in these scenarios. Only give direction via a formal communication channel. That doesn't sound like founders mode. That sounds like professional leadership mode, right? Chesky says much of the same stuff, but we just have to enter these kind of ideas into the same equation. I'm glad the discussion is happening. I'm glad we're weighing in. I'm glad it's going viral. 
because it's the opportunity to say there's a better way. Yes, and and maybe that's why Ben didn't edit and PG didn't ask him to uh, his, his his essay about founder mode. Um, there are a bunch of ways. I think one of the things I I, I really liked um, was sort of talking about your points of trust and transparency because when we go back again, as I'm thinking through my first founder journey, I don't know what good looks like. And so sometimes the default when you're hiring these quote professional managers is like, what is their pedigree or what is their resume? And and they might actually be really talented. They probably are if they held a leadership position at one of these companies at the right time in their career. But they might be the wrong cultural fit or they might be the wrong stage fit. And so one of the the parts that stood out to me on um, Brian's or Lenny's podcast when Brian was on, he said, Way too many founders apologize for how they want to run the company. They find some midpoint between how they want to run the company and how the people that they hire and lead want to run the company. And that is a good way to make everybody miserable. And so for people who are scaling a company, whether you're the founder or actually anybody in a leadership position that needs to hire their next bench... You talk about these key points for trust and transparency. So I'll, I'll go through them five. I wanted to say the first one, and then I want you to kind of go through and tell me a little bit about what these mean, because I think this is actually a playbook for how you can make founder mode effective, or maybe founder mode plus scaling mode to get into leadership mode. So the first one you write about was called hire the right leaders. What does that mean? So um, I think you were about ready to nail it. I was about ready to jump in, but you were on a roll. Um, hire subject matter experts but make sure you hire them and they are adaptable and agile. If they come in thinking they know everything, they're the wrong leader. Founders should have their convictions on how to run a company. Founders should lead with values and behaviors and what our culture is here. Perfectly fine. I'm a huge proponent of that. Have a clear point of view at every level of the company from CEO on down. It's okay if people have different point of views, but we have the same values and same behaviors. Um, Bezos is famous for saying, maybe it's not Bezos, might be somebody else, hire leaders with very, very strong convictions, strong points of view, but loosely held. Meaning, I'm going to adapt everything that I've learned in my career to this particular company. Fixed mindset executive people are, are the traditional managers that Paul's talking about. Don't hire those people. Hire the right leaders who have subject matter expertise that know way more than you do but are willing to give their best ideas, listen to others' best ideas, and everyone adapts to find the best idea among all of them around the table. If you can do that, you can have an amazing team and you'll never be in this founder's mode versus traditional manager mode. You're gonna have one mode, which is called leadership mode. Ask them what the last nonfiction or business book that they read was. And if they say some uh, management book out of McKinsey, uh, maybe not the right approach. Yeah, should be uh, doomed. Yeah, if they doomed. read, if, if they read PG's uh, founder mode, uh, maybe interesting. Depends on their take. Uh, and if they uh, read the cookbook, then they're probably in a, a good spot. Um, are there places? Are there places in a management team where? I'm trying to sort of assess as as a founder. I'm looking around my management. Are there places where it's more acceptable and or encouraged for a founder to be going deeper, to be doing more skip levels, or have a they stronger should. say in I, in other I places? Think they should have permission to do all of that, right? But that should be part of the culture. I don't think I don't think there's this. I've hired somebody now; they get to run it. Like this is what I call number two on this trust and transparent creating transparent feedback loops, which is. Tell I'm the host. I'll tell you when we go to number two. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, exactly. We should do right. So, so there, there. I mean, that's fine with me as a founder, right? I'm just, I'm just no, no, but I love it. But I love it because you—that was a great dichotomy, right? It's, it's, um, we are going. You know, I, I, I reserve the right as a founder because just who I am. That I, I get to sit on your meetings whenever I want to, right? You still run the meetings. But it doesn't mean I'm not holding you accountable or I don't get to be in the details. It's not this or that. It's I get to pop in and out. And you know, Scott Cook would do that all the time. Tell me more. What's an example? He still goes into Intuit three or four days a week, 40 years later. That's incredible. It is incredible because uh, he cares. Yeah. And he shows up and people are like, oh, Scott's in the meeting. And that makes them nervous. Yeah. But people know he's going to do it. Hey, we'll get back to the conversation in a moment after a word from our sponsors. 
The tech world turns to the Brave browser for its unbeatable privacy protections. But did you know that Brave also has a private ad platform? Brave Ads offers first-party targeting, and it's been cookie-less since day one, so you can relax while third-party tracking cookies disappear from the web. Today, millions of people turn to ad blockers to avoid being tracked and pestered online. But Brave's new ad model aligns incentives for users and advertisers. Users earn rewards for viewing ads, which they can save, spend, or pass along to their favorite creators. And advertisers score points for respecting user privacy, generating ROI without invasive tracking. So whether it's high impact announcements on the new tab page or keyword targeted ads in Brave Search, Brave Search offers diverse, private, future-proof ad formats for all your business goals. Join the future of advertising at brave.com slash ads. Mention Turpentine to get 25% off your first campaign. Omniki uses generative AI to enable you to launch hundreds of thousands of ad iterations that actually work customized across all platforms with a click of a button. I believe in Omniki so much that I invested in it and I recommend you use it too. Use Cogrev to get a 10% discount. One of the things in the point of Create Transparent Feedback Loops was about sort of sharing uh, sort of your decision-making framework um, or, or something, which can mean probably different things. Uh, to different people. Uh, but it's sort of, I think, in line with sort of document what's your hypothesis, what's your assumptions. T- tell me more about how this came to be. Well, I, I learned this I learned this uh, really, really intensely at Mozilla because we were in, op- op- this comes from open source. Open source culture, people are working mostly uh, remotely and they document everything. And at first I thought it was just a huge drag and huge inefficiency. But anybody who's worked in an open source environment, and Brian Chesky says that's himself. He goes into details in that in that uh, Lenny's podcast. Um, he was stunned at how much time it saves him to be able to just review what other people have done because we have a culture of writing things down. So he said it better than I ever could have. I'm still not saying it as as good as Brian says it, but this 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 culture of writing down your assumptions, this culture of constantly referring to them allows anybody to come in and come out and put a comment asynchronously on it. And then you can version it. It's not like it's gospel because you wrote it down. It's not like we carved this meeting into a mountain. It never changes. It's just, this is what we were thinking at the time. Oh, wow. We were really thinking that assumption. That's wrong. The world has changed. Now we don't have to have another meeting to talk about the meeting that we had six months ago and restart it from ground zero, we can take the meeting, it was documented, and we can say that assumption was wrong, let's tweak it and course correct. I was talking to a client about this today to to digress just slightly, and I think AI is gonna help this a ton because all these note takers, I use Fathom, for example, um, I just realized that's that's what these note takers are doing. We're talking, it's taking notes for us, so I don't even have to take, so, oh, it's a huge burden to write things down, and then I have to challenge that assumption. Is it a burden to write things down? Because you just install Fathom and you're not writing anything and your notes just get written for you. How about we change our model to review the notes that Fathom wrote for us? We have to change the way we're working because it's really more efficient to actually point people to the meeting notes. I, uh, I, my, my wife is an executive at the payments company Square and um, their culture is so different than, than me. And it's, it didn't dawn on me, I think till right now, how Jack Dorsey at the time was running Twitter and Square. How do you possibly keep on top of this stuff? They write everything down. And their meetings are the first 15 minutes is silence. They're just sitting there all reading. It can be hundreds of people sometimes just reading the notes and going through. And then whoever is the the leader that's responsible for whatever the decision or the outcome is, there's like a box and um, they're going through and they're making comments. And the people are like real time responding in the comments. And then they put the discussion topics on the top and then they go through and they run through the discussion Jack, topics. Jack and Sarah Fryer and other executives of Square Prider that uh, stole that from Jeff Bezos. Us. They're big. Both are big proponents of best ofs, and you probably know this. But this is Jeff's silent reading. Jeff introduced this as silent reading at Amazon, posted about it several times throughout the years, and it's the six-page memo. And everybody comes into a major meeting, and they, if you know, it's silent reading because he assumes that no one's read it. So we're going to start the meeting by reading. And believe it or not, everyone who uses this technique says the meetings are way more efficient. 
Oh, she the fir- the first impression seems consistently like this is very odd, and now she's she's bought in every company that she goes in to to work at or lead. Um, not that she's planning on leaving Square if anybody's listening at this time. Uh, it's like she said, I'm sold, I'm bought in. It's so great because there's you don't need to create a transparent feedback loop because it's already just part of the culture, and anybody can dive into whatever the meeting is, the takeaways, the outcomes, the key controversies, the decision, and all of the logic and data that supported it. And what you have is it actually runs faster. You also gain alignment so yeah. much quicker. Yes. But you can point you can point to notes. So you said you don't need to create a transparent feedback loop, but that is the transparent feedback loop. It's the writing. It's the writing of it. If that's okay. the culture, that's fair. If that's yeah. the culture. So you just reminded me that you know this is a great book from Claire Hughes Johnson. Oh, one of my favorites. Scaling people. Yeah. What is what is the main premise? One of the main premises of this of this book is um, she introduces concept of read about me. She wrote about herself. And she institutes this um, program of read me. She calls it read me. Um, before you get to know me, read me. And it's it's a self profile. She, I'm this. This is my superpower. This is my kryptonite. I like it when you do this. I hate it when you do that. Like I'm just gonna skip all of this uh, stuff so you know me before you even walk in the room with me. And I've I've written it down. It stores on my bio, and I want everyone in my department and my company to use this same framework to do a readme so that everyone knows who they're dealing with instead of us all taking these psychographic profiling tests. How to work with Claire? Well, I'll just, how about I just tell you how to work with me? So, but this is another form of writing things down. How much Claire, for those being the, the COO of, of Stripe and helping them scale tremendously um, and enabling, you know, whatever Stripe's culture of founder mode is, but like it doesn't, It doesn't operate without amazing people like Claire, who happened to share her knowledge in in an insane book. And for me, totally inspired me. Everybody that is in the company has an about me, Sasha, and all of my new hires I send because it helps them understand like about me. It's like insane. It's so simple. We're we're down to the meat of it now, right? We're totally down to the meat of this conversation now. But now let's go all the way back up to the top and say, does that sound like founders mode? Have we talked about why Mark had to hire Sheryl Sandberg and why Claire came into Stripe and why Sarah Fryer came in to Square? And wait, aren't there like every other example except for the five they named of which these professional managers who have never been CEO before came in and they actually acted like founders? Hmm. Maybe we should talk about how to do that with very specific techniques. Yeah. Um, Actually... Like, I think, f- funny enough, Claire and Sheryl Sandberg, I-, I think, had a stint in, like, government even at one point, which is, like, almost the antithesis of, like... Ah, <laughs> ah but, oh. but what does government always do? Mess it up? They always write it down. Everything, <laughs> everything is documented in standard operating procedures in the government. So it's, I didn't know that, but it's very interesting that that's the DNA. Yeah, it's sort of, I guess, is, is also funny... When you think about it, is sort of like the 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 Twitter interpretation of founder mode versus manager mode is sort of like dictatorship versus democracy. Um, and uh, you know, I think dictatorship is probably good for the dictator and bad for everybody else until that dictator eventually gets overtoppled and and turns. It's a great analogy. Into right. It's a great analogy. But I, I'm going to argue that neither dictatorship nor democracy probably wins long term. Um, localized uh, grassroots empowerment is the winner in every society. Democracy eventually fails, but local always wins. I mean, I we're also all just in like a simulation from AI bots anyway. So like all of this stuff is just some big computer experiment uh, that we're we're all living in. Uh, along the way. All right, let's go back. Number three: structure, ownership, and accountability at all levels. I think this is key, right? So when we talk about founders mode, they're like, I want to take a back ownership and I want to, I want to, I want to make the decisions now because I don't think my professional faking managers are making the right decisions. Well, again, look at the mirror founder and say, that's not the best use of your time. The best use of your time is creating the product and creating these structures where you can rely on the transparent feedback loops and you can hold your leaders that you've hired accountable and say, I thought we agreed this was the expectation. 
you wrote this down and you didn't do it. You can still hold your leaders accountable and give them ownership without doing their work for them. And by the way, that will save you a ton of time to do what you're really good at. Because let's agree that you can't be good. Could you imagine all founders being a CFO or all founders being a CTO or all founders being a head of marketing or all founders being great at sales? And yet that's kind of what was being uh, you know, suggested from this founders mode, me going, I'm going to do all the jobs. Like, okay, uh, can I de-invest in that company now? <laughs> I, uh, I mean, one of my most frequent conversations, especially with first time founders, especially with first time founders who come from an engineering background who are you know, generally high ambition, high IQ, high technical are like, um, accounting can't be that hard. Like I'm just gonna write a couple Python scripts and I think I'll solve it. Uh, you, know, like, you know, it takes six years to become a CPA um, and then it takes years of practice to like understand how businesses actually operate. And then uh, maybe you become a controller or a CFO or, or something like that. Uh, like there's a lot of super deep expertise in here. And every year there's two to three companies that get funded that says, we're going to be the next into it. Um, and, and there hasn't been one in 38 years uh, for, for a reason. Great business. Puzzle, puzzle will be next. Puzzle um, will be next. It's uh, we're, we're we're making our strides. Um, so how do you then? How, what are some maybe some lessons learned? How, what is a good way to structure ownership and accountability? What's a what's a founder mode way to structure ownership and accountability? The well, the bad ways are always easier to, to talk about. The bad way is the CEO makes every single decision. We heard about for years that Sergey and Larry would would hire would make the final decision on every single hire even when they were like 5,000 people, this does not scale. And here's why. If a founder makes all the decisions and takes all the ownership and all the accountability, let's go to the other side of the equation of what's happening to the rest of the org. And I ask the question, how do you learn? Are, are the people learning anything? Because if you're not letting them fail 20% of the time, and I talk about this a lot, Failing or course correcting is where all the learning and expertise and wisdom comes from. If you have a structure where you own everything and are accountable for everything, your firm will eventually fail. I feel strongly about this because the rest of your 100 employees or more, by the time you've hired those professional managers, aren't learning anything. They're not improving. And you are getting busier and busier as a founder, and you will eventually burn out. Let them fail, delegate risk as far down as you can. Everyone's going to delegate it differently, but let them fail, let them learn, hold them accountable for as long as they shoot 80%, keep them on board. Because if you're 80% in anything, you're highly successful in life and in business, but expect them to fail 20% of the time, as long as they course correct quickly. And as long as they take your feedback as a founder and say, I'll do better next time. Isn't that what great coaches do, right? Great owners should be doing this. They do. I, I want to move on to the, the number four because I think it, it brings it up. But I just I was laughing because it reminds me of the the. Well, I think Roger Federer was giving like a commencement speech or something, and he said something like, "Do you know what separates the the very best players in the world is I they win fifty two percent of the games that they play." Um, it's like you cannot dwell in the past. You have to learn. You have to get better. You have to improve. You can think about it, but um, uh, it was a little tangent. How do you implement? So I think maybe implementing the good way moves to number four, which is founders as leaders, as coaches or captains. What does that mean? I love I love this this concept. Uh, you know, that's why I call it Cook's Playbooks. I've been on sports teams my whole life, um, and some people might say, "Oh, you know," some people don't relate to sports. It's not about sports; it's about the team, and it's a team of individuals. And in every team of individuals, there has to be a captain, which could be the founder. The coach, um, the captain, doesn't have to be. It could be a professional captain brought in from the outside, whatever. Um, but this is the person who sets the tone on, on, on the court, in the locker room, holds people accountable. Um, and imagine a team without a captain. Imagine a bunch of individual all-stars. We've seen them before in professional sports. The New York Yankees many times have hired the best with their payroll and there's, they've all just been individuals. You know, the LA Lakers for years had superstars, but they couldn't play together. And then you get the Warriors come along and, you know, a bunch of people that really shouldn't win, but they played as a team and they all played their position. There was one captain and, and it just works. And so 
I think if you can think yourself as a eventually, I would encourage all founders to think of themselves as coaches and captains to immerse the rest of their team in their own values. Don't give up your values, hold them accountable for their values, but expect them to live up to your values and hold them accountable to your values and how we work and how we play. And you get that bully pulpit, if you want, of, of being that captain and saying, you know, you kind of failed here, do it better, right? Like, I think it gives you the, the best of freedom, but it's not founder's mode versus everything else. It's where you're going to use your founder's mode to your best example, to your best um, ability. Ability, yeah. W one, of the, one of the differences, though, in coaches versus captains is, is coaches are not on the field. They're helping get the best out of people. Captains are on the field. Uh, what's your view? One of the other pieces I say, what, what's your view on professional professional I wrote, managers? I wrote coaches and captains to, to combine them all into one bullet point. But I did, I do view captains as the professional executives because they weren't the coach or the founder. And I viewed the founders as the coach. So if you want to separate my coaches as founders, captains, but they should both be exhibiting the same behavior. I'm hoping that my captains, many times the captains in sports are so, so love the leadership role. They end up being the coach of the team after they retire, right? Hopefully my captains are embodying the same behaviors that I do as a coach, right? And they're just my right-hand person for the team kind of thing. Is it, I'm trying to think, you know, I'm trying to, to have a poor analogy of sort of projecting myself onto the situation. Um, and there are, are places where I really like to kind of be in the details. Um, and there are other places where I really derive, on the other hand, I also really derive a lot of joy out of watching my team be successful. How, how should I think about balancing these two somewhat conflicting oh, I would, internal I ideas? I don't think they're conflicting at all, right, Sash? I, I think every founder, every person, every executive has their specialty that they're really, really good at. Never, ever give that up. If you're a great product founder, if you're a great marketing founder, then stay in the details of product and marketing. Stay in the vision. Attend those meetings. Attend the engineering meetings because you're not very if you're not if you're not very technical. And learn if you want to learn about DevOps and engineering and cloud and be curious. But don't ever give up the thing that got you there. But don't ever also believe that because you're a founder in founders mode that you can go into the engineering meeting and tell them how to run DevOps and how to set up the cloud because you're smarter than they are. All you got to do is listen and tell them how to do it. You will never learn as much as they've learned in 15 or 20 years that they've been doing it. Um, and don't, don't delude yourself into thinking that you're smarter than they are. Uh, learn, but, but stick, to, stick, stick, to your, stick to your thing that you love the most. Don't ever get out of it. Don't ever, like you might hire somebody for product and marketing if, you, if that's who you are as a CEO, but you still want to like, hey, can I have an agreement with you that we're, you know, you know I'm going to weigh in with you here. I'm going to be your board of directors. You're going to be the CEO of product marketing. I could be your board. Set up that kind of structure. Right? Stick with it, right? If, if, we, if we bring this now to sort of a lot of uh, our audience or, or finance teams and founders, um, the, the last one on your list is this specialized operator, which I sort of, as a founder and knowing the complexities of finance and accounting, uh, I, I, it's hard to just read a book and become a CFO. Um, so I think the CFOs can be one of the places that like fall into specialized operators. And you're right, sort of in military special operations, uh, generals, founders, and execs aren't involved in every mission, but they select highly trained operatives to lead specific missions. How should we think about the founder finance relationship in the world of founder mode? In, in finance in particular, you're right. It's probably the hardest for a founder to play. Um, if I'm the founder and I'm biased because I come from the CFO world, but if I'm the founder and take my CFO hat off completely, I want my CFO showing up with a curious learning mentality about how to blend their financial expertise with my strategy and my vision and vice versa. I want to open the door and create a safe space. If I'm the founder for my CFO to challenge me as the, as the founder and say, I want you to, I want, I would literally say to my CFO as a founder, I want, I'm going to tell you my strategy and vision all the time. I'm going to lead with product. I need you to push back and challenge me on the risks, the financial risks you see, 
I want you to look around corners that I can't see from a financial perspective. And I want you to teach me what it is that I'm my blind spots on this. And if you can do that, if I can do that, and then you can show up learning more about strategy and vision, we're going to be a great left hand, right hand partnership. So, you know, my strengths, your strengths is how you show up with each one of these specialized operators, agree what your strengths are, agree what your weaknesses are. Every specialized operator has one. Every founder has one. Define what those are and then define the partnership of how, how combined you guys are just this dynamic duo that can't lose. Whether it's founder and engineer, founder and product, founder and marketing, founder of finance, there's a strength and a weakness on both sides. It usually always is. There's a, I'm going to show up this way. I need you to show up that way. We're going to commit ourselves to this. And you need to challenge me and I need to challenge you. And it's not personal. Let's go. How does right? this evolve from, say, a Series A to a scaling company to a public company? So Series A is more a founder's mode almost all the time, right? Series B is when you start dipping your toe in the water for starting to scale. And certainly by Series C, I think in most cases, you have to start operating this way and get better at it and better at it. There comes a point when you're private for long enough or you're big enough or you're, you have such, or you're a public company and you've got more money than projects like Facebook has or Meta has now or other Google has now, where you then, it then comes full circle. I've watched it happen at Google and with Ruth and having to break down, you know, all the Google X labs and Meta's going through this now with their reality labs and kind of toning down the whole metaverse and focusing on other things where you have to break down the very largest of companies into smaller, almost startups inside of these big companies. So it will come full circle. The best, the best companies who serve long-term break down their long-standing enterprises into small startups and start all over again. Uh, all right. I was just reading over and there's so much insane more that we just didn't have time to talk to, but you can find Cook's playbooks on Substack. Uh, search for Founders Mode, setting the record straight or Jim Cook. Is there anything in here? I mean, there's so much more and the links to all the Brian Chesky docs and, and the essays and everything else. Is there anything you think we didn't, we didn't touch on? I'm that, gonna uh, just, yeah. I'm just going to, because I, because part, most of this post was going to the tape for Brian. Um, I think, I, I, and I buried it at the bottom. I probably should have put it more toward the top, but I don't want people to miss what Brian said, which really impacted me. Brian, in this video nine months ago, talking about finders, founders mode, used the words, quote, I'm here to create one shared consciousness in my company. And if I pause and listen to that, that is not founders mode. One shared consciousness is how Brian thinks about building his business, building his team. That is not founders mode as we've been hearing it. The second thing he said, which is even more powerful, Brian is such an amazing guy. He said, quote, I certainly hope I continue to learn and always be a beginner. He goes on to say, if 100% of what I say here is what I still believe years from now, then I actually haven't learned much of anything. Learning mode. If only 70% of what I'm saying right here, right now, I still believe in years from now, what that means is I've 30% of what I believed now has changed and it means I've learned something. He goes, he finally, he ends it with, I sincerely hope I retract or change or modify something I've said here today in a few years. This will mean I have gained more wisdom. So if all we've done here today, Sasha, is enter a counterpoint, enter this being a learner, not a fixed mindset, not a polarization, this or that founder or traditional manager, then we've, we've done our job, right? Because be more like Brian, be more like Ben, be a curious learner, course correct quickly, you know, don't be, don't be polarized. And I guess now we have a method to see um, when you're looking to join a new company, uh, what type of company it is by whether the CEO liked, quote, tweeted, um, or disregarded uh, the founder mode. Anyway, Jim, this was awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for writing it. Everybody here, please, we'll link to the show notes, but please go to Substack. There is just one of many of the 30 years of wisdom that Jim is sharing with everybody all the time. Uh, thanks so much. Awesome, Sash. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in to Turpentine Finance. Share it with your executive team, direct reports, friends, and family. And if you want to support the show, the best ways are to leave a review wherever you're listening and subscribe. Turpentine Finance is part of Turpentine, the podcast network behind Moment of Zen, Turpentine VC, Age of Miracles, and more. Shows for experts, by experts in tech.